قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم The concept of unity amongst the followers of the Madhab of Ahl al-Bayt has been the dream of many of our powerful leaders and within the course of history. Many of our ulama, many of our maraj'ahs aim were to be able to unite the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt. Since the beginning of the role of scholars within the Shi'i sect, and specifically the Ishna Ashari sect, scholars such as the likes of al-Shaykh al-Kulayni, Sheikh al Tusi, and all the way to the contemporary scholars of Sayyid Muhsin al Hakim, Sayyid Abu al Hassan al Asfahani, the current Marjaiya in the holy city of Najaf al Ashraf. They have worked hard in order to create unity amongst the followers of the madhab of the Ahl al-Bayt. And since the settlement and the migration of the Shi'i community to the West, whether it is the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, Australia, the EU, Members of our community, activists, youth, have always tried to bring the community together. Though such events are extremely difficult to take place. Though it is not easy to come together often when it does happen, it makes us feel proud, makes us feel strong. And we understand the importance of unity once we're together. Because we are a small minority in a minority. And our strength is in our numbers. And there is no better way for us to unite than the banner of Imam al Hussein and the love for Imam al Hussein. We find the followers of the Ahl al Bayt united all over the world, from all over the world, overlooking their nationalities, their colors, their languages, their backgrounds their political affiliations when it comes to Imam al Hussein, And that is embedded and witnessed in every step that people take during the march in the Arba'een. Where you find millions of the followers of the Madhab of Ahl al-Bayt, the adherers of the Madhab of Al-Muhammad coming together in solidarity 
And there you find this very beautiful statement almost everywhere you go. The love of Hussein unites us. People open up their homes. People save money the entire year so they can put that at the service of the za'ir of Imam al Hussein. People save the entire year so that they can take part in this peaceful, most loving march that takes place around the mausoleum and the shrine of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Abi Abdullah al Hussein. However, the question is, why is it that we can't always be like that? Why is it that we can't always remain as united, so loving, so compassionate to one another? And though this unity is heartbreaking, we must understand it. We must comprehend it. Then we'll be in a better position to make better decisions. Before I engage in the discourse this evening and in my presentation this evening, I'd, I'd like to make something extremely clear. I'd like to point out a flaw that I often see. I come across this issue almost everywhere that I go. Almost every community that I visit. At times, I believe many of us are under the impression that it is okay for us to speak of our personal opinions about the leadership of our community Specifically the maraja', the ulama, the fuqaha. And I've come across individuals who publicly attack certain scholars, certain ulama. And when you ask this individual, excuse me, what exactly is your background and your profession? Uh, let's say, they'll say something like, you know, I own a 7-Eleven or I own a restaurant, or a Dunkin' Donuts. Have you ever spent time in the seminary amongst ulama? Are you a scholar yourself? Are you at least a student of the Islamic sciences? And the answer is no. Have you spent time at the seminary, at the Hawza? And I can tell you most of those people, the longest period that they've actually spent in a seminary would be the two days layover they have in Najaf. While they land in the holy city of Najaf, sometimes they sleep overnight at a hausa, because as you know, the hotels are full capacity, so they'll end up sleeping in the dorms of the hausa. That's the closest they've probably been to the seminary. And on the way back, they may spend another night at the hausa. But that's about it. And you wonder what has given this person the impression that they can go around and critique scholars and publicly denounce them or give their opinion. And that's caused a lot of disunity amongst us, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, for a very long period of time. And the reason why it hasn't stopped, brothers and sisters, is... The unfortunate reality that some scholars, some local individuals will speak of this to their audience and normalize the fact that it is okay for normal individuals, for average individuals to attack, to accuse, to spread rumors about the ulama to a point that you know, all our discussions, 
surrounding the ulama would mean not their achievements, not their contributions to the Islamic sciences, but this person is pro-Azadari, so I love him, I respect him. This person is against Azadari, he's not my favorite scholar. This alim is a coward. This alim is brave. This alim is modern. And, and the funniest one was, this alim, somebody told me this, this alim is not as equipped when it comes to Islamic legal theory, also known as Alm Usul al Fiqh. <laughs> and I asked this person, Do you even know what Alm Usul al Fiqh is? Islamic legal theory is? Can you name me three books in Islamic legal theory? And he said, No, but this is what I've heard from somebody else. Just like the ulama, just like the maraja', just like the scholars and the fuqaha, don't intervene in how you run your Dunkin' Donuts and your 7 Eleven and your grocery store and your practice. Similarly, we should not be the ones that intervene, interfere and critique them if we are not in that position. As they may, this may come, come across extremely harsh, but let me tell you something brothers. I've also come across many of the youth whom I love and I respect that text me or send me messages or get in touch with me and they'll say, Sayyidna, what do you think of this specific marja? Again, the question is, what do you think of this specific marja? Now, do you expect that I would give you an academic opinion? Because I highly doubt that's the answer you're looking for. But if you expect a person like me to focus on the negative, to focus on things that you may see as negative in this alim, to divide the community, then that is not the akhlaq and the mannerism of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. And that is something we must not take lightly ever. Truly. I see some people taking this extremely lightly. Some people sometimes get in touch and they ask me, what do you think of this marja? What do you think of this alim? And when I actually don't respond to them, they get angry. Sayyidna, why are you dodging the question? I'm not dodging the question. I don't think you're in position to have this conversation with. And I think if everybody was as firm when it comes to this particular issue, we would not have so many Chinese whispers, gossip, backbiting of the ulama becoming, you know, the, the sweetness of our uh, majalis when we sit at home, when we gather amongst each other. You know, the spice of the majlis, the spice of the gathering would then be the, the way we speak of the scholars and sometimes we defame them. Tonight, I want to speak about an unfortunate reality, a reality we should not deny. That disunity exists amongst us. And disunity is not a new phenomenon, it's always existed. It's existed since the time of Amir al Mu'mineen for the Shi'i Madhab. And this is an extremely in depth conversation. In fact, it's existed during the time of Rasulullah because we know and we believe that Shi'ism was founded in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Rasulullah, he was the one that used the terminology of Ali wa Shi'atih. Hada wa Shi'atih. Pointing to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen and saying him, this person pointing to Amir al-Mu'mineen and his Shi'a and his followers. This unity amongst the followers of Ahlul Bayt began then. And after Amir al-Mu'mineen, and after Imam al Hussein, and in the time of Imam Zain al-Abideen, and in the time of Imam al-Baqir, and the time of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim the time of Imam al-Jawad, the time of Imam Hassan al-Askari, where you literally would find tens, if not hundreds, of fractions and sects and schools within the Shi'i Madhab. 
And today we'd like to examine the history behind those divisions. Why is it that divisions occurred? Why is it that so many groups and denominations came about within the household of those who adhere to the madhab of Ahlul Bayt? And I'd like to do that in the following manner. I'd like to examine three main causes. There are many more. But those are the main three reasons why divisions occurred and continue to occur until today. And six schools of thought that were established, came to life, came to existence because of those three reasons. When we study history, then we ask ourselves and we see those causes. And we ask ourselves, the followers of Al Muhammad should ask themselves, is history repeating itself? Is there a way for us to learn from history and avoid making the same mistakes? Is there a way where we can avoid further disunity? Is there a way that we can come together more often with more understanding, with more love and compassion? Because we all know that is going to please Allah. That's going to please Rasulullah. And that's going to please the Ahlul Bayt. And we must aim to strive for that. The first reason, the first cause, is anger and frustration in the period of misinformation and the formation of the Zaydis, Al Zaydiya, and the formation of Al Kaysaniya. Number two, it is the Number two is extremism. Extremism and the formation of al batriya and Al-Ghulat. And number three, it is the corruption amongst the leadership and the formation of al khattabiya and al waqifa let us examine this topic in depth. Let us try to have an understanding and draw a conclusion. Brothers and sisters, the setup today, the way that we're doing this is, is extremely difficult, as you've all seen. We've already had an interruption, unfortunately. We had a power outage. But I am astonished to see so many people show up. To see you so dedicated to the cause of the Ahlul Bayt. So dedicated to the Aza of Imam Al Hussein. May Allah bless you all. May Allah shower this gathering with his Rahman and compassion. Let us examine this topic after your three loud salawats ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The first cause of disunity amongst the followers of the Ahlul Bayt since the beginning of the establishment of this madhab and once it took its foundations after the presence of Amir al muminin in Kufa and specifically after the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein, 
fractions and denominations began to be witness amongst this Shi'i household. Obviously, you know that there were many revolts, many revolutions occurred after the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein to seek the vengeance of Imam al-Hussein. Many of them were not successful. However, the two most successful ones were the ones led by Zayd bin Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali or so known as Zayd al-Shaheed. And the other was led by Al-Mukhtar, Al-Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, Al-Tha'ir, also known as the Kaysani school. Today, we come across many individuals who are Zaydis. Many of our brothers and sisters in Yemen who have witnessed a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty and pain in the past few years. They adhere to the school of Zayd bin Ali al-Shaheed. Who was Zayd? Zayd, brothers and sisters, was the son of Imam al-Sajjad, Imam Zayn al-Abideen. And he has a beautiful story. When his mother was about to give birth to him, or she gave birth to him, Imam Zayn al-Abideen, traditions tell us, history tells us, he opened the Holy Quran. What we call tafa'ul. He opened the Holy Quran to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves for him from messages. And this ayah came. In Allah ashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. Allah has made a transaction between certain mu'mineen where he buys, he purchases their souls and their wealth and everything they have to offer fi sabilillah and in return, Allah gives them the grand prize and that is Jannah. يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَيُقْتَلُونَ فَيَقْتُلُونَ وَيُقْتَلُونَ The 111th ayah from Surah At-Tawbah where Allah speaks of the jihad of the martyrs fi sabilillah, those who stand against oppression and injustice. Immediately, Imam Zayn al Abidin said, Wallah innahu Zayd, Wallah innahu Zayd. I swear by the Almighty that indeed it is Zayd. Why? Because Rasulullah had spoken of a son to Zayn al-Abideen by the name of Zayd, who will become a martyr, a shaheed. And Rasulullah had informed that he will not only become a martyr, but he will be crucified in Kufa. Zayd was a student of his father Zayn al-Abideen. Zayd was a alim. Zayd was a faqih. Zayd was abid. And that's the characteristics and the qualities of Zayd. He's been described to us in history as somebody of extreme taqwa. After Imam Zayn al Abidin. While Imam Muhammad al-Baqir was the Imam, one day he visited or he was forced into the presence of Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik who was the Umawi Caliph at the time. And Hisham Al-Umawi, the Umayyad Caliph, looked at him and he said to him, كَيْفَ أَخُوكَ الْبَقَرَةِ 
How is your brother the cow? Na'udhu billah. So Zayd says to him, Sammahu Rasulullah al-Baqir. Rasulullah has named him al-Baqir. He's given him the title of al-Baqir. You're calling him al-Baqara, the cow? He said, I've heard that you and your brothers and your brother are calling people to aid you. And you've declared yourself as leaders. Then he looked at Zayd and he told him, you are the son of a, a slave girl. Because Zayd's mother was indeed a slave girl. Zayd looked at him and he said, that is not something shameful. I'm not ashamed of that. The mother of the Prophet Ismail was also a slave. She gave birth to the son of Ibrahim, Ismail, who then became the grandfather of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. There is no shame in that. He disrespected him and then he kicked him out with humiliation. And the whole plan was for Hisham ibn Abdul Malik to test the waters and to see whether if he makes Zayd angry enough, Zayd was going to go towards Kufa and revolt. So he sent his spies following Zayd's caravan. He said if, they, if he goes towards Medina, leave him. He's going back to Medina, there's no harm. If he goes, back to, if he goes towards Kufa, know that he's planning a revolt. So you follow him and you take him out. Of course... Al Abi Talib, Al Bayt Rasulullah are the brightest, wisest of individuals. So Zayd took his caravan and his men and they went towards Medina for several days when they were certain that the spies have left them. Zayd changed the plan and he went to Kufa. There he met with the heads of the tribes of the Kufi, of the Kufans, the people of Kufa, and he took bay'ah. He took bay'ah to revolt against Bani Umayyah and the injustice of Bani Umayyah. And traditions, history tells us that 15,000 people gave him allegiance. Many people believe that when Zayd was taking bay'ah, he was taking bay'ah for himself as an imam at the time of Imam al-Baqir. However, that is not the case. We the Athna Asharis, we believe Zayd, he knew his imam was Imam al-Baqir and after Imam al-Baqir it would be Imam al-Sadiq and he was a alim but he wanted to take bay'ah for people in order to create an army against Bani Umayyah. And that was something necessary. However, like I said, when there is anger, when there is frustration, when there is so much dhulm onto the Shi'i community, and at the period of misinformation, and inshallah I'll speak of misinformation, such, such divisions may occur. Zayd revolted. Unfortunately, his revolt in Kufa was not successful. He has a tragic story, an unfortunate story, a heartbreaking story. As tragic as the story of Imam al Hussein and the companions of Imam al Hussein. And he was killed and slain. After he was buried, they dug his grave. They beheaded him. They crucified him. Allahu Akbar. Look at the dhulm and the injustice of Bani Umayyah. Today when you look at ISIS and how they amputate the hands of people, how they wanted to dig the graves of certain noble individuals from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, 
the ulama, and how they wanted to destroy the graves of Al-Askariyain, even Amir al-Mu'mineen's grave, even Imam Hussein's grave, don't be surprised. Those are the children of Bani Umayyah. They learned from Bani Umayyah and the school of thought of Bani Umayyah. And today, whoever defends them, you have to understand that this person has an Umayyad ideology. And that ideology is the barbaric ideology of terrorism. They dug him. They cut his head, crucified him. And a year later, some traditions tell us a year later what was remaining of his body, they burned it and they turned it into ashes. This is what happened to Zayd. Al-Imam Al-Baqir cried for Zayd. Imam Al-Sadiq cried for Zayd. Imam Al-Sadiq said, Rahimallah ammi Zaydan fa'annahu law wa salala wafa Zayd was a alim if he would have gotten to the Khilafah if he would have gotten to power he would not have forgotten who the power belongs to and another tradition he says Allah will Unite Zayd Ma'a Shuhada'i Rasulullah Wal Hussein However misinformation Frustration Led for people to believe that Zayd Is asking people for a bay'ah as an imam And I don't have time to enter to the details of this issue But I also like to speak of the Kaysaniyah Kaysaniya, some people tell you Kaysan was Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, the brother of Imam al Hussein, the son of Amir al Mu'mineen. Some people tell you it was Mukhtar, some people tell you it was somebody else. But it seems that the popular opinion of historians and scholars tells us no, indeed, it was Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya was the son of Amir al Mu'mineen, obviously not from Fatima. He was the brother of Hassan and Hussein, the half brother of Hassan and Hussein. And history tells us that in the Battle of Jamal, in the Battle of Jamal, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen looks at him and he says, Ya Muhammad, inna ka waladi haqqa. O oh Muhammad, indeed. You are my son. Truly you are my son. This was seen by some that this meant he should be the imam after al-imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. Some say no after Imam al Hussein, And after Imam al Hussein's martyrdom Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya was the one who motivated the uprisings after the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein and specifically the uprising of al-Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, Abu Ubaidah. And Mukhtar, when he wanted to have an uprising to fight Bani Umayyah, to take control of Kufa, to be able to have a political system, he as well took bay'ah for himself. But again, we find that that bay'ah was not for himself as an imam, but as a political leader. With that said, brothers and sisters, I'd like to speak of our reality today, because I said, we have to be able to connect the dots to our reality, to connect the history to our reality today. Sometimes we come across events, scenarios, in our contemporary lives, in the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And I believe some people think that those who are more vocal, those who are loud, 
those who every day they give their opinion, they don't shy away from speaking out loud, are the bravest of individuals. But indeed, you want me to tell you who is the bravest of individuals? It is the one who remains silent. Because silence is very difficult. And I'm not saying always. I'm not saying, you know, silence is the, the key. Silence is the way. No. But sometimes, silence is the most difficult route anybody can take. And Amir al-Mu'mineen tells us. He says, when there is great fitna, when there is a great disunity, and things are not clear to you specifically, to me specifically, I don't know. I don't know the entire picture. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I can't really understand the whole entire concept. Yes, sometimes I hear certain things and I get so excited. Amir al muminin says, if you don't have clarity, and he points to the sun and he says, as clear as you witnessing the sun, then your responsibility is silence. The safest way is the silent way, to be silent, to be mute, and to see and await what comes next. Sometimes the bravest thing a alim can do is to actually remain silent and not to say anything. The most difficult thing to do is to actually remain silent and not to say anything. Sometimes being proactive, making a difference is by silence and not always having to speak. And we witness this and what happened in Iraq during the civil war. Amongst Muslims, sometimes in the same city, sometimes in the same tribe, where they were killing each other and beheading each other. The wisdom of the Marjaiya of Najaf did not encourage a sectarian war and further bloodshed. And it was that wisdom that saved Iraq out of that misery. And this is something that the entire world is a witness to. Number two. Number two is extremism. And the formation of the Batris and the Ghulat. Who are the Batris and who are the Ghulat? Though sometimes we hear some People use this term, batteries. Uh, we don't know what it is. Probably they don't even know what it is. <clears throat> the batteries were a group and a sect formed by the name, by a leader by the name of Al Abtar. Al Abtar, a reference to a person who was missing an arm or two. He was their leader. Again, he lived in the time of Al-Imam Al-Baqir. And they were Shias and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. However, this person had a new vision. And he began to speak about this vision. And he spread this ideology so much until there was a movement. There was a school of thought formed. So they once went to visit Imam Al-Baqir. And there was Zayd, Zayd al-Shaheed, Zayd al-Alim, Zayd al-Fadl. They came, they greeted al-Imam al-Baqir. And their leader, Ibn al-Akthar al-Abtar, said to Imam al-Baqir, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, are we not supposed to follow the footsteps of Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, yes. Said Ali ibn Abi Talib gave an allegiance to the first and the second Khalifa. Similarly, we will give an allegiance to the first and the second Khalifa. Imam al Baqir remained silent. Rijal al Kashi, one of our prominent books, tells us of this hadith that Zayd there and then told them. أَخَذَلْتُمْ فَاطِمَةِ 
Are you now? Forgetting the miseries and the stance of Fatima, the stance of Fatima from the first and the second Khalifa, have you forgotten the stance? The books of the Muslims all together tell us that Fatima to Zahra became a martyr, and in the and until the last moments of her lives, of her life. She was displeased. This, those are the words of Imam al-Bukhari. Those are the words of many of the ulama and the scholars of the school of Sahaba. Wahya wajidatun ala shaykhain. Being displeased with the shaykhain. The first khalifa and the second khalifa. So he said to them, this is a form of abandoning the cause of Fatima, being disloyal to the cause of Fatima. Then he said, Batartum Amrana. You have created a new division. And he gave them the title of the batteries. Now, many people might think that this fraction of individuals is something that existed in history and does not continue until today. However, we have had scholars, speakers, thinkers who have been highly influenced by the Batri ideology. Some have categorized the late Dr. Ali Shariati, a person who publicly in his works praised the first and the second Khalifa. Contemporaries such as Dr. Surush. And this in no shape or form is a disrespect. However, this is an ideology. And sometimes this ideology is also an ideology of reconciliation, forgetting our differences, bringing everybody together, making everybody happy, so to speak. Is that feasible? Is that something achievable, brothers and sisters? You know, if you look at Individuals who tell you you shouldn't say this because it displeases a group of people. You shouldn't speak of what's in this book because it will harm the unity. You shouldn't speak of this truth because many people will be hurt and driven away. I say, well, I wish you were there to give this advice to Maytham al-Tammar, to Ammar, to Salman, to Amir al-Mu'mineen himself. Because Amir al-Mu'mineen, he never actually cared about what pleases people. Maytham al-Tammar, he could have escaped being crucified. Ammar could have just remained neutral. Fatima to Zahra, salawatullahi alayha. Similarly, just to please everybody. Sometimes we ought to take a stance to continue the legacy that is left for us from Rasulullah and after Rasulullah. Anni mukhallifun fikum al-thaqalain kitab Allahi wa itrati. The itra, al-tahira, the family of Rasulullah, they dictate to us what we should say, when we should remain silent, when we should speak. And sometimes we find that those principles are compromised, unfortunately. Then, on the other extreme, we have the ghulat, the ghulat that lived in the time of Imam al-Jawad, 
They existed in the time of Amir al muminin but their formation, and, it can, and they continued their formation what is in the time of Imam al-Jawad all the way to Imam Hassan al-Askari. And the Ghulat are the ones that exaggerate the position of the Ahl al-Bayt. The Ahl al-Bayt who taught us, they are the servants, the submissive servants to Allah. Imam al Hussein. On the 10th of Muharram, he gave everything he can for the sake of Allah. While all the calamities fell onto him, he says, قَدْ حَوَّنَ مَا نَزَلَ بِي بِأَنَّهُ فِي عَيْنِ اللَّهِ Allah has a witness. He took his strength from Allah. They attributed godly attributes to the Ahl al-Bayt. Or they put them Above Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And our ulama, our scholars, the Ahl al-Bayt themselves have, extremely, have been extremely vocal when it comes to this issue, brothers and sisters. And unfortunately, sometimes I see people still involved in this ideology and sometimes it's literally spoken of right from the member of Imam al Hussein, And we think this is a form of honoring Imam al Hussein. We think this is a form of honoring the Ahl al-Bayt. People make up all sorts of stories and, and we even have what's called the Al-Isra'iliyat. Al-Isra'iliyat are a hadith that infiltrated our books a hadith, for example, that were formed by the Sabais, Abdullah ibn Saba, that got into our books and they attributed things to the Ahl al Bayt that Ahl al Bayt themselves would not agree with. Ahl al Bayt themselves disassociated themselves from the Ghulat many times. And I remember not too long ago, I heard somebody from the member of Imam al Hussein speaking to an audience of Imam al Hussein and confusing them so much. We don't need to exaggerate the position of Ahl al Bayt and Al Muhammad. Allah has honored them enough. They have enough great attributes for us to learn from. For us to love and emulate. We don't need to attribute things that don't actually exist to bring harm to the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. This is not doing justice to the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into the examples. But both ends, this movement that on the 10th of Muharram, Ziyarat Ashura is not red. People do not wear black. People do not mourn Imam al Hussein. People do not weep and cry for Imam al Hussein. It's unacceptable. And on the other hand, extremism, making all of the madhab of Ahl al Bayt. All of the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt are the legacy and the sciences of the Ahl al-Bayt confined in one or two particular methods of Sha'a'ir. Number three. Number three was the corruption in the leadership. Unfortunately, within the course of history, we have come across different sects that became offshoots of the Shi'i Madhab because of corrupt leadership. Because Hubbud Dunya took over those individuals. Amongst them are the Khattabis. Abu al-Khattab, not Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abu al-Khattab, 
he was a student of Imam al-Sadiq. And then he claimed that Imam al-Sadiq was a prophet and he was the representative. He was the Imam of Imam. He was the Khalifa of Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq disassociated himself from him. He told people to tell him to stop. We have traditions that Imam al-Sadiq says, Allahumma al-an ibn al-Khattab. Allahumma adhiqhu harra al-hadid. Imam al-Sadiq sending la'na and curse upon Abu al-Khattab. Then, after Imam al-Sadiq passed away, he claimed that Imam al-Sadiq, na'udhu billah, was God. And that he is a prophet. Did he not? No, of course he did. He was one of the students of Imam al-Sadiq. But it is hubb dunya It is the love of the dunya that sometimes takes over individuals. Even those surrounding the imams. Even those surrounding the ulama. Even those surrounding the fuqaha. And we have seen this in the course of history. The Waqafi Madhab was formed by Ali ibn Hamza al-Bata'ini and al-Qandi. One of them had 30,000 golden dinars and the other one had 70,000 golden dinars. From the Khums money of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. After Imam Musa ibn Ja'far died, they said the best thing to do in order for us to keep the 100,000 golden dinars is to say Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was the 12th Imam, he's the Qa'im. And he will return, he's the Messiah. And they unanimously agreed that they're going to boycott Imam al rada And that is how the Waqafi Madhab was formed. Brothers, sisters, during all those tribulations, all those difficult moments, there, is, there are two main elements that allow the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt to continue. And with this I conclude. Number one, what protected the legacy of Imam al Hussein, the legacy of As-Siddiqah al-Tahira Fatima al-Zahra, were the majalis of Imam al Hussein and the aza of Imam al Hussein and the azadari of Imam al Hussein. And the visitation of Imam al Hussein. Today, if you support this majlis, if you support other majalis, you have to understand it is those majalis that have continued every year, even though there are hardships, there are difficulties. Today, there is rain, there is a storm, we lost electricity. People, sometimes when they're walking towards the shrine of Imam al Hussein, there are, there's rain, there is cold weather, people get ill. But nothing stops them from showing their love, their devotion to Imam al Hussein. And that is the protection of our madhab. Especially the mothers. The role of the mothers that teach their kids before the month of Muharram begins. To wear black. They are the ones that decorate their homes. With the flags of Imam al Hussein. They are the ones that drive their children. Teach their children. To be an azadar of Imam al Hussein. This is the protection of our madhab. And number two. It is the role of the ulama. In fact, some people might question and say, well, does that mean the ulama, the religious institution, are they ma'asum? Absolutely not. Do they make mistakes? Yes. Can they perfect things? Yes, definitely. I said yesterday, can they listen to the audience and to the people and to the followers more? Absolutely. But it is them. It is the role of the Hawza, it is the role of the Ulama that has protected the community of the believers. And that is not something we should undermine. 
We should not discredit the ulama, beginning from al-Sheikh al-Kulayni, Sheikh al-Tusi, Allama al-Majlisi, the grand contemporary ulama, Sayyid al-Hakim, Sayyid al-Khoi, and the contemporary Marjiyya and Najaf, we should not undermine their role, their fatherly figure, and their protection for the madhab, and the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. However, us brothers and sisters being here this evening, even the ones that are sitting at home, like I said, and have welcomed us to their rooms, to their living rooms, who are sitting sometimes on a couch, sometimes on the floor, wearing black, waiting for the Aza of Imam Hussein to be recited during such circumstances. Imam al Hussein, when he stood on the 10th of Muharram and he said, He was speaking to me and you. What do we say to him? We say, Ya Aba Abdullah, in such circumstances we have to abandon you. Excuse us. We apologize. But we say, No. We will find a way. We will find a way to participate in your aza and erect majalis for you and make sure that your message continues and there is nothing that comes between us and your aza, ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana. Ya ibn Rasulillah, ya ibn Fatima, we will never abandon you. For moments, for just moments, allow me to take you to Karbala. This evening again. Facing the shrine of Imam al Hussein. On that land, on that soil that unites the lovers of Hussein. The land of Karbala. The holy land. Tibtum. طبتم وطابت الأرض التي فيها دفنتم وفستم والله فوزا عظيما فيا ليتني the Imam the Imam al Maqsum says فيا ليتني كنت معكم فأفوز فوزا عظيما it's holy land let us go to that land with our hearts with our souls and let us speak to him and say to him يا سيدنا وماولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا. All of you who have حاجات. يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند Allah, 